In this video, I'm going to talk about the spectrum of synchrotron, or relativistic cyclotron emission. Now, Previously, we talked about how given a magnetic field and an electron moving at relativistic speeds, spiraling in that magnetic field, we generate highly beamed emission. So that if we take an alternate view with the magnetic field going into the page and the electron spinning in circles around that magnetic field, that towards an observer over here, if this re electron is moving relativistically such that its beam pattern is quite tight with a width of 2 over gamma, where gamma is the Lorentz factor, that instead of seeing a continuous sinusoid of emission as you would in cyclotron emission, an observer sees pulsed emission versus time. And we worked out the width of that pulse as observed to be 1 over gamma squared times 1 over the cyclotron frequency with also a dependence on the inclination angle, sine alpha, where alpha was the angle that the electron's velocity made from being perpendicular to the magnetic field. And this 1 over gamma squared dependence was important, and for the most part came as a result of this electron, which is moving at almost the speed of light, chasing down the photons that it itself was emitting in this direction, so that Although photons were emitted over a wider interval in time, that time interval was compressed by Doppler shifting, or the fact that this electron was chasing down the photons it was emitting. So this contraction of the observed time of arrival of these photons meant that instead of emitting at a characteristic frequency, we now get a pulse of emission that has a variety of frequency components. And we had plotted that the power emitted as a function of frequency, and I'll plot a log-log plot here, versus frequency had a characteristic shape with a peak defined by a cutoff frequency. Notice I've switched to omegas here for angular frequencies being 3 halves gamma squared times omega cyclotron times sine alpha. And at the lower frequency end this scaling has a general new to the one-third slope and above the cutoff frequency we get a rapid exponential dampening with piece of nu being proportional to nu to the one-half e to the minus nu. So the upshot here is that synchrotron emission is relatively peaked towards the cutoff frequency here. Emission is peaked over there, but it does have a significant tail off to lower frequencies. But this was a spectrum for a single electron, moving at a speed characterized by gamma, this relativistic Lorentz factor here. So what happens when we have an ensemble of electrons? Well, for one thing, because this cutoff frequency here depends on gamma, which is related to the energy of the electrons, we need to make some assumption about what the distribution of these electron energies are in this group of electrons. So let's assume that the differential number of electrons, dn, in some energy interval, dE, goes as a power law. So it's proportional to the energy to some power p. p is sometimes called the differential energy spectrum index. And the reason that we assume that the distribution of electrons as a function of energy is a power law is simply because that's what we observe. So let's make this assumption and try to work out how the power of the emission that we would observe from this ensemble of electrons varies with energy. So the power we observe radiated by electrons in some differential energy interval, dE, is given by the number of electrons in that interval, so dN over dE, times the power of the radiation that those electrons emit, which is a function of energy. Now we worked out in a previous video that the total power radiated by an electron undergoing synchrotron emission was equal to two-thirds e to the fourth b squared or me squared c cubed times gamma squared sine alpha. Now for what we're doing here, because we're just using scaling relations, we'll drop our constants. We'll keep our b field, because we're generally interested in that scaling. And we'll keep our gamma squared, because of course that's related to energy. So this is the total power emitted by electrons in this differential energy interval, where we'll take this gamma to the, be the appropriate gamma for some energy. Now, of course, this power is going to be radiated over a range of frequencies, as we just described. 
But we're going to ignore that. We're going to assume that this spectrum of synchrotron emission is peaked enough towards this cutoff frequency that we can just relate an energy to a frequency of emission. So essentially we're going to imagine that for whatever gamma the energy of this electron corresponds to that we've chosen here in this interval, all of the power that's emitted as synchrotron radiation will be piled into this frequency interval, this small frequency interval around omega cutoff. And that's not an unreasonable assumption. So dNDE, we just said, was given by the energy to some power, p, and we're taking p to be proportional to gamma squared b squared. Because gamma is proportional to energy, we can write gamma squared as a e squared times the magnetic field squared b. And it's a little confusing. We're putting e's here next to b's. These e's are energies. This b is a magnetic field. You may be tempted to look at these e's and think electric field because they're next to a b field, but these are energies. So in total, we get dPTDE, the differential power radiated for a differential energy interval, is proportional to b squared times energy to the 2 plus p. And then we'll start incorporating our idea here that we can relate an energy of an electron to a single emitted frequency to change this e down here into a nu. Now our expression for the cutoff frequency said that nu was going to be proportional to gamma squared times the cyclotron frequency. And the cyclotron frequency had a factor of the magnetic field in it, b. And as we just argued, gammas are proportional to energy, so nu is going to be proportional to e squared b. Remember, this e is the energy of the electron emitting. So said another way, then e is proportional to nu over b to the one-half power, which means that dE is proportional to nu to the minus one-half times b to the minus one-half d nu. So that gets us that dE d nu is proportional to nu times b to the minus one-half. So then using that, we can multiply both sides of this proportionality to say that the change in power over a, an interval of electron energy times how the interval of electron energy relates to an interval of frequency is proportional to b squared e to the 2 plus p. And then we'll plug in the right-hand side of this proportionality over here to give us nu to the minus 1 half b to the minus 1 half. Now the last thing we want to do here is just go ahead and get rid of all our e's, express them all in terms of observing frequency which we can just use this equation here for. And we end up that dp d nu goes as b to the 3 halves times nu to the 2 plus p over 2 for the new component of that e times b to the minus 2 plus p over 2 for the b component of that e and then this last nu to the minus 1 half term. So combining that all together we get that that is b to the 1 minus p over 2 times nu to the 1 plus p over 2. So just to write that a little neater down here, dp d nu is proportional to b times nu over p to the 1 plus p over 2. So this is an interesting relationship. It says whatever the spectral index of the distribution of electrons versus energy is, the distribution of the emission power versus frequency is a considerable amount flatter than that. And I just want to warn one thing, which is true for basically all spectral index discussions, is that a lot of people will define spectral indices with a negative p. So, for example, if you are following along in Rybicki and Lightman, they define their power law to be e to the minus p, where we've decided that our power law will be e to the positive p. So whenever you read their text and you notice that they have a 1 minus p, that's because their p is negative of ours. So for any spectral law index discussion, you should really look up to how they define their spectral law index, with a minus sign or not. But what we've done here is self-consistent. Now this is interesting because the spectral index of synchrotron emission is something you can just go out and measure. And that's been done, and it depends a little bit on frequency, but basically we find that the spectral index of synchrotron emission in our galaxy 
varies between minus 0.75 and minus 0.5. For your radio astronomers out there, if you're used to talking things in terms of brightness temperature, that means the brightness temperature of synchrotron goes to a frequency to the minus 2.75 to minus 2.5. And that's because brightness temperature, you remember, is defined by I sub nu is 2kt over lambda squared, which means that there's a frequency squared on this side of the equation, which means that temperature is going to be, when you isolate it, a, a factor of frequency to the minus 2 steeper than the spectral index we've defined here. Anyway, the interesting thing is that using these constraints that we can just observe, we get that the power law of electron distribution versus energy, P, is somewhere between minus 3 and minus 2. Now, I don't know if there's an a priori derivation for why we should expect electron distributions in this range, but that's a nice empirical result there, which is just talking about mechanisms for generating relativistic electrons in our galaxy. So those are the basics of the scaling of the spectrum of synchrotron emission versus frequency and versus the strength of the magnetic field. We derive this all in terms of the index for the power law describing the distribution of electrons versus energy, P, and then we derived the observed synchrotron spectral index versus frequency nu in terms of that power law index P. And finally, we used observational constraints to constrain a range of P between minus 3 and minus 2. And those are the basics of the synchrotron spectrum.